Dr. Killian called me and said, Bob, would you be interested in coming and addressing the uh, U.S. Army Symposium? My first reaction was typically Canadian, Orlando, December. <laughs> Canadians don't mind being cold. There's no use being stupid about it. <laughs> but after that millisecond of thought, I uh, reflected on this opportunity and to come and engage with the 24 other nations that uh, the U.S. Army Science community had invited to this symposium, and what an opportunity. And let me just say on behalf of, of that international community, a thank you to, uh, to the U.S. Army Science community. I believe that this interaction through this forum is enormously important to us all. We are all the richer for it, so thank you very much. In my remarks today, I thought I'd do uh, three things. And it begins with perhaps the, uh, the title of my slide, improving co of my presentation, Improving Coalitions Through S&T Cooperation. I believe the evidence is compelling that this, in fact, is happening. I also have the view that there's opportunity for improvement. So two of the things I'm going to do is give you a bit of a story of, from a Canadian perspective of how our international cooperation in science and technology is helping our warfighters uh, succeed together. And a bit of a challenge function to wrap up on where I think there's opportunities for some improvement. But I think it's important that I start and give you perhaps a Canadian perspective on, on defense, defense and security, science and technology as we see it today. So let me begin with uh, some remarks from our perspective of what is this thing called defense and security in December 2008. And uh, from our perspective, there's five big drivers that are influencing our, our realities. Um, and I would suggest if we had gone back five years ago, there would have been a different a list. In fact, arguably, if you went back to uh, July, there would have been a different list. Uh, but the first is the nature of the threat, the asymmetric threat that's rooted in the global war against terror, failed and failing states, and the simple reality that what we know is an asymmetric threat, in fact, is the conventional threat. And our militaries must be able to succeed in that reality. The second is the growing complexity of the conflict spectrum that our warfighters face. From the notion of the three-block war to fighting a counterinsurgency where while success in the security axis is fun fundamental to success, in and of itself, it is not enough. And the requirement for a comprehensive approach that brings in with it the dimensions of development and good governance, a strong public sector, are also ingredients to success. Who would have thought a year ago that we would be dealing with the global problem of piracy? And an issue that's particularly relevant to the nations that share this continent is that North America is now an operational theater. In the bottom left, I would argue that going back 15 years ago, certainly in Canada, the communities engaged in matters of defense and those dealing with domestic security were largely separate. The Venn diagram overlapped, but the debate was largely focused in separate directions. Today, that is one agenda. There is only one defense and security agenda, and while the various agents of that agenda play different roles, in particular our defense department, they are all playing to the same story. In the center, the reality of the global economy. Uh, we all hope that, in fact, the turmoil that's being expressed in the financial markets and the play through to the pressures in our economies will be short-lived. But I think it's fair to say that the outcome of that will be profound to structures and the way governments fund the investments it makes moving forward, and there will be implications for our world. And finally, in the bottom right, the observation that quite independent of those other points is this phenomenon of global globalization of science and technology. No longer are the technologies that will be critical to the success of our warfighters tomorrow uniquely behind the closed doors of our defense laboratories. Science and technology is a global enter enterprise being driven in large measure through the civil sector. The technologies that provide warfighting advantage, while they do provide advantage, are increasingly short-lived in, in the advantage they provide. 
and the technologies that are the underpinning success to our warfighters are increasingly available to our potential adversaries. And it's in that reality that we need to move forward. Next slide, please. In a Canadian context, we've had over the past uh, few years a clearer expression of where our government wants to go in, a, in positioning a strong defense and security foundation for our nation. We have had recently had announced a comprehensive defense strategy called Canada First Defense Strategy. You may be aware that our parliament voted to extend the presence of Canadian forces in uh, southern Afghanistan through the end of 2011. Uh, the government has committed to uh, an update of its national security statement. We in Canada, having a north that is a landmass larger than the entire landmass of Europe, are cons and, uh, rightly so focused on the north, and we have a northern strategy with one of its pillars being the question of sovereignty and security, and an economic agenda for moving forward. That has basically translated into a focus for defense and security science and technology to ensure that it is maximizing the impact of that investment on Canadian defense and security capabilities and at the same time on the nation's innovation capacity. Next one, please. This uh, defense strategy I wanted to take a moment and, and speak about because it's got um, a number of elements that are f a first for Canada. First, it clearly articulates the government's level of ambition for the Canadian forces looking forward for the next 10 years, next 20 years, in fact, founded on three broad principles. Excel at home, be a reliable partner in the defense of North America, and provide leadership internationally. It recognizes that the investment in the Canadian forces must be balanced across the dimensions of people, equipment, infrastructure, and readiness. For the first time in a policy statement, it is said that the expenditures made in defense are expected to see socioeconomic benefits to Canada and to Canadians. While global competition will remain the mainstay of our acquisition system, the challenge before us is to position Canadian industry and vertical supply chains to be competitive in that acquisition process. And, for, and finally, the government had provided a long-term stable fiscal framework for moving forward and we'll see in the coming months to what extent that will be able to be delivered or perhaps at a different uh, pace. That's our world. I'm sure that a number of my remarks there resonate uh, with, with your views. The question of course of what we do about it. I'm reminded of the story of the engineer, and I'm an engineer, uh, an avid golfer who uh, one day invited three of his uh, colleagues to his home course. The round was going fine. They got to the 16th hole, a par five straightaway. The engineer took a mighty swing. The ball traveled down the fairway at about 200, uh, 200 yards. It veered hook sharp to the left across a stream, across a, a fence, bounced on a road, bounced off the tire of a passing school bus, and bounced back onto the fairway some 300 yards down the, uh, the course. His three colleagues said together, astounded, how on earth did he do that? The engineer replied, it's quite simple, really. The first thing is you have to know the bus schedule. <laughs> so what are we doing to try to deal with this reality moving forward? Next slide, please. Founded in a, uh, a strategy for, for S&T and national defense, we have come forward with four big ideas to change the paradigm in which we manage our investment in this critical area. And I'll spend a moment to describe those to you. I recall Dr. Killian's remarks uh, yesterday of saying that in many ways we're delivering science and technology to two problems, those today and those of the future. In Canada, that's translated to the reality that science and technology must be what we call full service. Each of our defense institutions works in a structure to address the realities of today and the questions of tomorrow. We have investments in policy and strategy. We look at the issue of force development, conce conce conceiving our forces on a 10 to 15 to 20 year time horizon. The production and maintenance of capability, particularly equipment acquisition. The generation of the forces capable of operating and finally operations. The simple opera observation I make to you is that science and technology must inform every one of those processes. But to do so, it needs to be designed to do so. And that design is fundamentally different across that spectrum. The second issue is the reality that oftentimes we consider 
the issues of, of our science and technology investment from a perspective of getting those scientists to do the right thing and do it well. But arguably, that's not the full question. If we look at our investment in science and technology as the metaphor of a car, we tend to focus on the fuel delivery and the engine. But you know something? The steering is pretty important. And without a transmission, you're not going to go anywhere. And in, in the challenge that the S&T communities of our the departments have is that they're not the transmission. And it's the relationship to others across those dimensions from strategy to operations that actually translates our results into effect. In our department, we've come to call that the Defense Science and Technology Enterprise, which is an, an attempt to connect together with commitment those that decide what needs to be done, those that do it, with those that exploit, and a mechanism that actually challenges whether we're doing it right. I do have the, uh, the pleasure in our department of being the quote-unquote functional authority for that enterprise, which means I basically say to my, uh, my boss, the deputy minister and the chief of defense staff, if it's working, fine. If it's not, what do we need to adjust? And it may not be in my turf. The third is a, a requirement to, to look at what our labs themselves need to be, our defense labs, and to say, in fact, what's different from industry and academia? and our allies, in many ways, uh, obviously key partners of that uh, S&T team, and a recognition that our labs have a role to play that's somewhat different than industry and academia. And that's to actually serve a, a synthesis role to take the advances in science and technology and to couple of those to the parallel advances in military concepts and doctrine and organization so that that science and technology has the necessary effect. And it's our strongly held belief that our labs are best positioned to provide that. We've coined the term science and technology integration for that function, not systems integration. And we feel that it actually adds enormous value to uh, the, uh, the entire innovation system that we're addressing. And finally, partnerships. The simple reality is our investments are never sufficient to meet all ends. And, um, I would suggest that that's recognized here in the U.S. and the engagement of the international community at that forum is a reflection on this. Uh, it's also important to have the right partnerships within our own defense institution, from the policy community to the acquisition community to the operational community. Next one. Just to, to translate this into uh, where the rubber hits the road, I want to give you a few examples on how science and technology is contributing to um, our full service capabilities in Canada. And I'll do this through the four areas that I've highlighted on this slide. I have one slide on each of these, so let me move forward. The, the first point is that science and technology effectively engage is an agent for informing emerging concepts and doctrine at the foundation of the forces moving forward. And as General Wallace highlighted in his remarks yesterday, that begins with an understanding of the strategic environment in which we sit. And while at the center, science and technology is identified as one of the key issues we need to address, in fact, the trends here from economic and social to environmental and resource to geopolitical to military and security can in and of themselves be informed by science. And from that, the Canadian forces have come forward with a, a long-term, high-level doctrinal foundation that will guide the development of the Canadian forces over the next 20 years, built on four big words. Comprehensive. The notion that the Canadian forces is an agent of government power in and of itself cannot necessarily meet all the challenges before us and how we integrate to other elements of government and into the international community, not just the military community, is foundational. The notion of integrated as opposed to joint the notion of adaptive, and finally networked. And as I would I point out to you, the piece of networked is not just about the technology, it's about the people. The next one, please. The second is, is looking at the capabilities that the, Canadian, that the Canadian forces must have. Here's our list of the key outcomes where science and technology is expected to have effect looking forward over the next uh, 10 years or so. I highlight just a couple of these. The notion of trusted situational awareness, intent prediction, and decision making for achieving operational superiority. Four, the agile tailored force to deploy and operate in complex environments. And the eighth, which uh, my colleagues in uniform have actually told me is the most difficult, defense policy and force development informed and enabled by science and technology developments. The next slide, please. 
A science and technology organization must take risk. It must explore the boundaries of enabling technologies that potentially become the disruptive forces for award-winning capabilities moving forward. It is clear that the building blocks of the 21st century are in the realm of bits and atoms and neurons and genes. One can say in a fairly simplistic way that technology in the 21st century is about making it smaller, make it faster, make it smarter, make it organic, and do it at the same time. What I can tell you with this list, with absolute assurance, is it's wrong. What I can tell you with absolute assurance is there's pieces of it that are right. I'm just not sure which ones. It is absolutely essential that we as community of science and scientists and technologists supporting our warfighters have such lists, that we openly debate them, we discuss them, we challenge them, we invest in them, and we evolve them. The next one, please. And I realize for those in the back that may be a bit of an eye test, but I also point out that our military at any point in time faces a set of hard problems. And we have our list of hard problems. Problems where science and technology is expected to deliver or advise on solutions. And I've just indicated to you the list of our hard problems, and I've broken those down purposely in three dimensions. There's first a set that are arguably uniquely in the defense realm, from defeating the IED system, as General Wallace mentioned, through to soldier survivability, to building the integrated command and control system that our Canadian forces need, which is both a technological challenge and, frankly, a cultural challenge. From growing the force, dealing with issues of recruiting, training, retaining, and duty of care for our soldiers, for our veterans, and for their families. Positioning defense to exploit emerging or disruptive technologies. Our acquisition systems don't purchase technologies. They purchase systems and platforms. Our challenge is to make those sure that those systems and platforms have the right technology in them. And finally, it is a very much the reality that as when Professor Sutton said, what is the difference between one platform and its next generation, the answer is science and technology, there is a second piece. It costs more. And we, frankly, need to focus more attention on making those future platforms more cost affordable through their life cycle as opposed to just assuming that the next generation will be more expensive to purchase and to maintain through its life cycle than the previous. There's a second group of, uh, of uh, challenges or hard problems here that we see at the interface between matters of science, uh, uh, defense and security. These are not issues where necessarily defense is in the lead, but defense has a role to play. And it's very much the dynamic we have with our national security communities at the forefront. Um, I've suggested that science needs to inform policy and or emerging concepts. And when we use big words like comprehensive, integrated, adaptive, and networked, they need to be founded in conceptual frameworks that can actually guide the move, move from the big word to the actual operational of the concept. Improving northern and maritime situational awareness uh, for Canada, for North America, and frankly, the response is something should need to be done. Building reusable national major event security capabilities, a lesson that we are learning in Canada up front and personal with the security around the Vancouver 2010 Winter Olympics. Defeating the CBRNE terrorist threat and enhancing the nation's cybersecurity. Both top priorities for defense, but I would suggest to you are actually national priorities and where, in fact, technologies coming out of the defense world can have application into the security realm. And finally, I've highlighted two that are at the global level. Issues that very much are in the uh, uh, reality of in the military these days, not necessarily a priority in the past in the context we're in, but certainly a priority today. Energy and power and the reality of being a green Canadian forces. Not all Army. It's dealing with the reality of environmental pressures moving forward and that our military will increasingly operate in, in rules of engagement that will be dictated by environmental, national, and international policies. We've also stood back to say, well, if that's what science and technology is going to do, what do we need to be smart at? If I could just see the next slide, please. Uh, and we've identified 
this view of the areas of expertise that we think we need to be strong in. There's 11 of them presented in, a, in this Venn diagram that we've actually borrowed from the theory of net centric warfare, looking at the world through the lens of physical information and human domains. I would suggest to you in our world 30 years ago, the focus was physical. Over the last 20, it's been information. I would suggest moving forward, it's the balance across the three. In fact, the largest growth in my organization over the last five years has been in the human and social sciences. And the most problematic areas in our view are the ones at the interface among those, those areas. And at the center, you notice the word complex systems. There's no classes of problems where our typical reductionist model to actually solving those pro problems uh, proves to fail where you can d reduce the problem, solve it at, uh, at, a, a, at a subsystem level, roll it back up, and you have the answer to the more complex system. Well, there's cases where that simply doesn't work. Next one. With that background, a few remarks on international S&T cooperation. First off, next one please, there are many, many instruments through which we cooperate from bilateral relationships to multilateral relationships through the technical cooperation program and NATO. Today, we are cooperating with our defense allies in 500 international activities. I don't know what the number is in the US, but it must be astronomical. The value to Canada for that collaboration from the cost shared, burden shared effort uh, is of the order of $100 million to us a year. This is big business for us. The next one, please. However, we actually try to peel back the onion and say, what are we actually getting out of that cooperation? Uh, while at the fundamental level, it's about burden sharing and knowledge and technology development, it is important to be a bit more precise. And that gets at the essence of why science and technology is so important to our military coalitions. We understand and respond to the real threats that our militaries are facing. We explore emerging science and technology for disruptive effect, the theme of this symposium. We help shape new military concepts and doctrine. We provide options for future military capabilities. We provide fora and mechanisms where our military can exercise and train on new and emerging military capabilities. We support current military operations and we contribute to national security through the dual use application of our defense technologies. In the time available, I can't go through that in any high level and touch on 500, but let me give you a few samples of things that are going on here just by way of, way of, way of example. And the first one, next one please, to just talk a bit about exploring emerging S&T for disruptive effect. The issue of, of power for the soldier. Uh, Time Magazine uh, recently in, announced its list of 50 uh, most significant innovations in the, the last year. And one of them is the work we're doing with a small Canadian company that will provide a, a bionic knee that essentially uses the same principle as a hybrid uh, engine in a car, taking advantage of the braking motion. This is in case the, this, the soldier's foot hitting the ground to be able to generate uh, power. The current prototypes are for a knee unit of uh, about two pounds generating three watts. The next prototype is trying to deliver five watts for less than a pound. To exploring femtosecond lasers, an emerging technology which now allows us to explore parts of the electro-optic spectrum getting into the terahertz range that previously we had not looked at and to exa examine nonlinear phenomena through the fact that these lasers are able to produce pulse uh, peak power in the terawatt range and examining new surface treatments that not only enhance durability but deal with certain degrees of toxicity that we know we're going to have to address as environmental legislation moves forward. Next one please to exploring options for new military capabilities. In the upper left, a cooperation that is in fact showcased in the exhibit uh, here today between uh, DRDC and Aviation Missiles RDEC, where we're looking at marrying up uh, our work on providing precision guidance to a Canadian 2.57 inch uh, rocket with a smart uh, launcher technology that AMR deck is moving forward. In the bottom left, work that we have done with uh, the US, uh, US Army Mountain uh, Georgia to actually go through systematic tests with soldiers to, to try to validate what technologies actually add 
to individual soldier and small combat team effectiveness. This has resulted in the publication of some 75 experiments that are shared within NATO as a test bench against which we can assess which technologies are most important for the warfighter of the future. In the upper right, uh, for the soldiers that uh, um, experience wounds but survive on the battlefield, the greatest threat to their survival is actually fluid loss. The largest, I believe this is correct, the largest clinical trial in the history of the National Institutes of Health and the Canadian equivalent, the Canadian Institute for Health Research, is currently on, underway in the trauma centers of Canadian and U.S. hospitals looking at the application of a defense technology for providing isotonic um, fluid resuscitation, saline resuscitation that works with one-third the volume and actually has less side effects due to resuscitation. Uh, this has proven so uh, popular that uh, the Canadian forces have already committed to its deployment into the Afghan theater, Afghanistan theater. And we've all talked about the issue over the last two days of traumatic brain injury, and there is a growing consortium among our nations to address this high priority. The next one, please. And one final example is to look at uh, this issue of counter IED and the work that's going on. This work is highly coordinated with the Joint IED uh, Defeat Organization with our colleagues in uh, the UK and Australia in particular, and it is looking at this from a systems perspective. From the perspective, an interesting application of serial killer technology that's used in the policing services to translate this over to our intelligence world for profiling the activities of bombers. This is being deployed this year into Afghanistan. In the detect side, to look at radical technologies that allow us to do pre-clearance of routes, which is in fact the, uh, the attack of choice for the Taliban. In the bottom right, through destructive testing based on solid analytical work done over the years through collaboration, we now have a, an understanding in depth of the vulnerabilities of Canadian vehicles, which has resulted in enormous investments made to strengthen those vehicles and save lives. Uh, two years ago, the commander of the Canadian Army uh, told me that uh, I held the, uh, the, uh, the unique um, uh, mark of having destroyed more of his vehicles than the Taliban. Unfortunately, that is not the case today. But the rigorous assessment of our vehicle vulnerabilities through techniques developed through our international collaboration is saving Canadian lives. And finally, looking at the enhancements to our personnel protective ensembles that our soldiers wear. Through the development of uh, casualty registries, it's work coming, uh, registries, work that's coming out of uh, NATO, we have applied that to the assessment of the autopsies on fallen Canadian soldiers and the injuries of the wounded, along with a careful examination of their protective, prote uh, personal protective ensembles to see where failures have occurred, which has resulted to turn around an improvement to those ensembles measured in months. And finally, on the bottom left, to ensure that our medics can go into theater, into the front line, positioned to respond to the type of injuries that our soldiers will see, receive, as a result of the use of uh, animal models in trauma medicine and training are developed with the U.S. Marine Corps, it has now been mandated by the Canadian Forces Surgeon General that all medics going into theater experience two, week of, two weeks of intensive trauma training at one of our research centers using this model, and the evidence is that we have among the best prepared medics to go into theater to save lives. To wrap that up, I would suggest to you that there's two broad perspectives for, that we have in Canada on S&T cooperation. Perhaps on the right, on the one hand, and oftentimes we tend to think, think of this as the centerpiece here, it is about burden sharing and technology development. It is about, about reducing risk to uh, national acquisition programs. And it is about contributing to, th to the reduction in through life cost of military systems. It is also about knowledge. It is through that interaction that we can come back into our na nation's min ministries of defense and support our internal decision processes. It informs our national science and technology programs. Where do we need to go? Because it seems to be that others are going there and maybe they've got it right. But it also makes our national programs more efficient because it makes people smarter. It gives them personal networks. It helps develop shared lexicons and standards. 
and it provides peer review. To wrap this up, a couple of challenges for us moving forward. Next slide, please. I'm going to provide two slides that give you uh, some of my thoughts on moving forward. The first is a recognition of just what are our strategic challenges to doing S&T cooperation better. It's not clear to me that all of these challenges are solvable, but I also believe that the first thing to try and to solve them is acknowledging that they exist. And I, I, would I would indicate that there are four. The first is I believe that as we look across the 26 nations in the room, we have differing expectations on our national science and technology programs. And it's important that we share those and understand those differences. The differences of scale. The investment that the U.S. makes in science and technology is considerably greater than its allies, uh, and that leads to different other sets of consequences. Our national acquisition programs operate in different business models, from the intent to acquire system solutions out of the global marketplace uh, using off-the-shelf technologies to custom defense equipment development, or a blend of both. And finally, the inevitable link between uh, investments in science and technology and defense acquisition and competing economic development objectives. As a final comment then, I would suggest here are some principles that uh, I, I, was, I would probably feel we'd all agree with, but let me just state them at the outset on the way forward. Trust matters. We expect our warfighters to fight together. We must set up the conditions where our scientists can work together in an environment of shared trust. Knowledge matters. Balance our cooperation spectrum from that knowledge cooperation to the technology cooperation spectrum. They are both important. A critical point, speed matters we must synchronize our S&T cooperation to the operational need for solutions. And finally, at the heart of this, it's all about people. People are crucial. Smart, informed, science and scientists and engineers enable stronger coalitions. The engagement of our best and brightest in the international journey is key to the success. I believe the evidence has been compelling that that's been the case in the past and there's enormous opportunity for that as we move forward. Thank you for uh, listening to me at the end of uh, a luncheon here, and um, I guess at this point, if there's any questions, I'd be prepared to try to respond.